Just ahead on Washington to Washington, it's a billion dollar business in Washington state. You put the combination of cannabis and cash together, um, just seems like, you know, matches and gas. But while legal here, recreational marijuana is not legal under federal law. That means banks who do business with cannabis companies face risks. The board and management could all be charged um, with money laundering. Um, so that's not a very uh, pleasant uh, thought. State officials on both sides of the aisle have urged Congress to find a solution to the banking problem. It's legal in the state now, and uh, legal industries should be able to bank their dollars. But those efforts have so far been unsuccessful. Senator McConnell does not want to vote on this. Uh, he doesn't want to have to make people vote, but this is a public safety issue. And to me, it represents political cowardice. In the nation's capital. This is about getting the cash out of a massive now retail uh, industry that is spread throughout the country and making us all more safe. A historic vote, the first ever federal standalone cannabis bill, passed the House. But now the legislation that would allow marijuana-related businesses to use traditional financial institutions faces an uphill battle in the Senate. We think that it should be made easier to research, uh, but not completely descheduled. And marijuana became officially illegal 50 years ago. But should it still be listed as a Schedule One drug today? We absolutely believe that veterans should have access. In fact, veterans should probably have the first access. And despite medical marijuana being legal in nearly three dozen states, Veterans in the VA system are prohibited from using it. The proposed legislation that could change that. From the capital of Washington state to the capital of the United States, this is Washington to Washington. Hello and welcome to Washington to Washington. I'm Jennifer Huntley in the vault at the state treasurer's office in Washington state, one of the first two states in the nation to legalize recreational marijuana back in 2012. And I'm Tammy Thuringer in Washington, D.C. As of today, 47 states have legalized some form of marijuana, but it's still federally illegal under the Controlled Substances Act. And that complicates things for those working in the cannabis industry. That's right, Tammy. In just a few short years here in Washington state, the cannabis industry has become a billion dollar business, bringing in hundreds of millions of dollars in taxes every year. But imagine owning a multi-million dollar business and having no place to bank your money. That's the situation many cannabis business owners are finding themselves in as they enter this new and growing industry. I always wanted to open my own business. Jim Mullen is living out his dream of being an entrepreneur. He and a partner opened The Herbery in 2015. It's a premium cannabis store in Vancouver, Washington. It was a little bit of a lark. Uh, what I did before, I had a 30-year career in the stevedoring industry. Uh, the last 12 years of my career, I managed the Port of Portland's Terminal 6 container facility. I was the terminal manager for 10 years and then the director of labor relations for the last two. But then the terminal closed and Mullen found himself in his mid 50s and searching for a second act. Around the same time the Port of Portland was losing its container business, Washington State was gaining a new kind of business. My wife is the one who first said, I want to have a pot store. Voters approved Initiative 502 in 2012, legalizing recreational marijuana use. Once the initiative went into effect, the Washington State Liquor and Cannabis Board began setting regulations for the new industry and setting up a lottery to limit the number of cannabis stores in cities and counties. Well, we got into the lottery. We went through all the paperwork process and we got vetted and we, uh, our numbers did not get pulled as winning numbers. But Mullen connected with someone who had won two of the licenses in Vancouver. We started about a three month dialogue to see if we could actually partner together and work together in this new industry and uh, decided that we could. Mullen and his partner opened their first cannabis store in Vancouver in February of 2015. I'm just gonna take 100% risk, roll the dice and partner up with Rick and we're gonna make this work, um, see where it goes. So, you know, high risk, kind of high reward opportunity that just worked out well. It worked out so well, they opened a second store in May of 2015. A third location was added in the fall of 2016. Uh, it was definitely the Wild West when we first started. I mean, you know, the LCB had its rules and regulations and a lot of people didn't follow them, didn't know how to follow them, or just weren't following them. Uh, the prices were 
up and down. It was a real roller coaster. The unpredictability of the industry leveled off, and this year the herbery made 18 million in gross sales, an 8% increase from last year. With that kind of income, you would think banks would be eager to work with them. But Mullen says in the beginning, we had problems finding any institution that would bank us. That's because of the current federal law prohibiting marijuana use. Federally insured banks that do business with cannabis stores or growers face the risk of prosecution for violating the law. This means that many growers and dispensaries have to operate as cash-only businesses. You put the combination of cannabis and cash together, um, it just seems like, you know, matches and gas. Mullen considers the herbery lucky. In the fall of 2014, he and his business partner went to a seminar in Seattle. Salau Credit Union announced they were willing to take on the risk of offering cannabis accounts. Mullen opened an account in advance of opening their first store. But they still can't take credit and debit cards for payment. We have two ways to make payments right now, cash, and then there's an app that we have. It's called CanPay, and it's like an Apple Pay. It's like an electronic debit card. Um, probably 7 or 8 percent of our transactions are with CanPay. I'm surprised it's not more. Since most transactions are in cash, stores often have thousands of dollars on hand at any given time. We need to take cash out of our stores. There's no reason that we should be obligated to carry as much cash as we do, which is a serious safety concern. The Herbery's main location is a fortress of security cameras. Thousands of dollars have gone to windows with hurricane-proof shutters and fencing outside doors. The business has had six break-in attempts and two break-ins. These are state regulations to have as much security as we do. And uh, it's to, I think, protect the product and the employees and the cash. Conflict between state and federal law presents other challenges, too. The weekend before our camera crew visited, one of their stores shut down because their landlord couldn't get approval from their credit union to rent to them. So even though some credit unions, like Salal, are willing to take on the potential risk of the feds getting involved, others don't even want an indirect connection to cannabis. They're still, because of the federal conflict, they could have been charged with money laundering. And that's not the end of the business headaches. It's a huge challenge, and it, it's uh, like an octopus. I mean, there are many different arms, that, and it touches a lot of different things people don't understand or realize. The Herbery had a global payroll company terminate services, leaving them to scramble to find another. They've had to work with vendors who don't have their own payroll services. We have some vendors that are like, hey, I'd like to deliver on Friday um, because I need to go back and I'll pay all my employees in cash because they don't have payroll services. Many insurance companies won't take cannabis clients. We pay an extremely high rate for all our insurance. You know, the, just the general uh, liability insurance that businesses have. Ours is probably three or four times higher than other companies because we're in that very high risk level for them. The federal conflict even touches the employees of cannabis stores. For employees, I mean, everything from getting an apartment to financing a car can be problematic for them. Mullen says that until Congress passes legislation to support cannabis banking, banks take a risk every time they take on cannabis customers. The Treasury Department could come in and shut them down or seize their assets at any time. One proposal is the Safe Banking Act. It passed in the U.S. House last September, but faces opposition in the U.S. Senate. Mullen says given his experiences, he can't imagine why anyone wouldn't support it. The benefits of allowing uh, Regulated banking are huge. The upside's huge in every way, and there's really no downside. So why it's such a problem is baffling. If the Safe Banking Act passes in Congress, it could potentially solve this issue for cannabis businesses. But there are some changes being proposed in the U.S. Senate to the House-backed bill. Tammy, can you tell us more about this bill and what it would do and what those changes are? Hi, Jennifer. The Safe Banking Act doesn't require banks to work with the marijuana industry. Instead, it would protect financial institutions that want to work with legitimate and licensed marijuana businesses. We've been working on this legislation for seven years, and we just got our first vote on the House floor, and it was overwhelming. The Secure and Fair Enforcement Banking Act passed the U.S. House by a vote of 321 to 103 back in September. I think it did so in such wide bipartisan majority because frankly people understand that this is a safety issue. We need to get the cash out of these businesses. Cannabis is a multi-billion dollar industry that largely operates on a cash only basis. That's because despite being medicinally or recreationally legal in many states, 
Federally insured banks and credit card companies hesitate to work with dispensaries and ancillary businesses out of fear they could be penalized for money laundering. Washington Congressman Denny Heck says the Safe Banking Act will boost public safety and improve transparency. It would get cash out of the retail business and instead of requiring people, for example, to stuff their backpacks full of cash and take them out of the marijuana store and go figure out a way that they can get it safely deposited. Frankly, I think tax revenue collections would go up as well for the, for the federal government because they had better eyes on these transactions. Don Murphy with the Marijuana Policy Project, an organization working to end the prohibition of cannabis, says the Safe Banking Act goes beyond just helping business owners. If you're an employee that gets paid in cash, that's no way to uh, uh, be an employee, right? That's no way to get in, uh, in the American dream, right? You want to buy a house, you want to buy a car. It's important to have access to banking, not just for the industry, but for the employees as well. But opponents of the bill argue the legislation isn't about individuals. We are deeply concerned with the implication, sort of the, not uh, we're concerned with the policy itself, but even more with the intended outcome of the policy. And so uh, if, if you listen to the investors in the marijuana, uh, who are investing in marijuana businesses, they say the purpose of the Safe Banking Act is to flood uh, the marijuana industry, marijuana businesses with billions in, in investment and grow it very quickly uh, in, in the United States and to try to, to um, uh, yeah, essentially grow, grow the, these businesses on a scale that they've been, had difficulty growing under current uh, banking restrictions. Garth Van Meter with Smart Approaches to Marijuana an organization opposed to the commercialization of marijuana says cannabis businesses already have the financial access they need. As we've had our allies go into uh, dispensaries, that, that the vast majority of dispensaries have found some sort of cashless option, uh, whether it be uh, debit card readers, some of them fraudulently take credit cards, uh, others use apps or uh, you know even Bitcoin ATMs. They, they've, they've found ways to handle uh, you know, the, their, their customer base's demand for cashless options. The U.S. Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN, came out with guidance for financial institutions who want to work with cannabis-related businesses in 2014. In states like Washington, where cannabis is legal, some local banks and credit unions are willing to work with the businesses. The most recent FinCEN report shows more than 700 banks and credit unions are actively working with marijuana-related businesses across the country. But the majority remain on the fence about whether it's worth the risk. Murphy thinks it is. I actually think that it's better for the government to, to allow for these industries to, to bank their proceeds, the, the legitimate industry to bank their proceeds, as opposed to the, the cartels who have to deal in cash. If you find a bag of cash, you don't know where it came from and you have to assume perhaps that it is an illicit source. Cash is also a concern for those who don't support the legislation. Open the door! Last July, several former heads of the Drug Enforcement Administration and the Office of National Drug Control Policy sent a letter to the chair and ranking member of the Senate Banking Committee expressing concerns about the Safe Banking Act. Cartels will go to enormous lengths and use sophisticated and complex methods to move cash into banks, since laundering money is the lifeblood of criminal organizations. It is therefore a virtual certainty that cartels will seek to exploit the Safe Banking Act if it provides them with an easier and more cost-effective means to launder their money. The legislation is currently before the Senate Banking, Housing and Urban Affairs Committee. It's opposed in its current form by committee chair Senator Mike Crapo. Crapo, a Republican, represents Idaho, one of only three states where all forms of marijuana are still illegal. In December, Senator Crapo released a statement saying the Safe Banking Act doesn't address potency levels, marketing tactics to children, or the lack of research on marijuana's effects. Murphy says those are separate issues. This is a banking bill. That's all it should be about. If you want to deal with potency, go down to the Judiciary Committee and deal with it there. And by the way, I don't believe banks would be able to work this, right? If you got proceeds from, from a sale of a product, the bank doesn't know what it is. No more than they know how much beer a, a liquor store sells versus spirits. It's just something that the bank sh shouldn't have to be involved in. But Van Meter says the legislation should be as inclusive as possible. That's just not a fair perspective to take, especially when that the, this banking bill is probably, you know, if this were even to move, it's the only 
piece of federal legislation that's going to move for a while. And so if all you do is inject billions of dollars and then have no uh, you know, means of, of regulating the public health side of things, uh, that would be grossly irresponsible. Public health has to be a part of this conversation as well. Separate from the changes Senator Crapo would like to see, the version of the Safe Banking Act sent to the Senate includes additional provisions aimed at increasing its likelihood for passage. One of those provisions would allow banks to also work with hemp-related businesses, a growing industry in Kentucky, the home state of Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. If the legislation makes it through the Senate, Congressman Heck says he believes it will be signed into law. The president's messages uh, as it relates to the Safe Banking Act and, it, and the predecessor legislation have been a bit mixed over the years, but of late they've come around to being more positive than not. So we think we have a favorable signal from them that, that they would work with us. And on any number of occasions as a member of the House Financial Services Committee, I've had an opportunity to question administration officials when they've testified before committee. And I am more than cautiously optimistic, I'm quite optimistic that the president would in fact sign this. All 10 House members of the Washington delegation voted in favor of the safe banking bill. It's unknown when the Senate Banking Committee could move on the legislation or if it could make it to the Senate floor for a full vote. Thanks, Tammy. So what about those banks in Washington state who have decided to offer services to cannabis business owners and employees? We offer them all the same business, all the same services that our, our regular businesses have today. How much of a risk are they actually taking? And why? That and more, just ahead. Welcome back to Washington to Washington. There are just a handful of banks and credit unions that take a risk and handle most of the accounts in Washington State for cannabis. About 20% of Salal Credit Union's clients are cannabis related. Salal believes offering services to the marijuana industry is worth it for many reasons. On a busy stretch of Fifth Avenue Northeast in the Northgate area of Seattle, Salal Credit Union sits across the street from the redevelopment project going on at Northgate Mall. Between the mall construction, light rail, and new condos, there are a lot of changes happening in this part of town, and Salal is right in the heart of it. Inside this branch of the credit union is the subdued scene of banking tellers and customers. But a closer look reveals who some of those new customers are, with brochures targeting the cannabis industry directly by offering home loans and other banking solutions. Our board back in 2012 uh, really started looking at this. So Lau Credit Union was one of the first credit unions in the state to offer banking services to those in the marijuana business. We recognized that there was going to be a big a public safety issue because there was going to be a lot of cash um, in, in these stores and so we felt that it was important to get the cash off the streets. I think if you look at the, the industry projections over the next seven to ten years it's, and even discount them by 25 percent, it's a, it's a many multi-billion dollar industry. Despite the obvious financial benefit of new customers for the bank, the bank is taking a risk. The board and management could all be charged um, with money laundering. Um, so that's not a very uh, pleasant uh, thought. Many banks and credit unions across the country have shied away from accepting deposits from marijuana businesses amid concerns that they could be considered criminally liable. Federal drug enforcement agencies also have the power to seize the deposits of cannabis businesses. But as more and more states legalize use for both medical and recreational purposes, Rosendahl sees the threat from the federal government lessen. It's really more around regulatory issues concerning, um, um, you know, limitations on capital or if um, we're not um, doing, uh, performing all the regulations right, um, the, the regulators might constrain our growth or tell us to actually close those accounts. But a threat still exists, especially after the Trump administration rescinded the Cole Memorandum, a policy memo created during the Obama administration that mostly protected marijuana legal states from federal intervention. I think that there was some concern when uh, uh, Attorney General Sessions um, repealed the Cole Memo. I think for a couple of weeks we were all wondering what was going to happen. Um, but we took a deep breath and we, we went and we talked to our state government, our, our, our examiners, and um, they supported us uh, through this process. And um, you know, we slowly got comfortable that, that there wasn't going to be a problem as long as we were doing things the correct way. 
Along with various federal threats, Salal has had to invest time and money into hiring staff with cannabis expertise. We have a business banking group and there's about 15 people in that organization. And most of them deal with cannabis in, some, in one form or another. We also have outside uh, lawyers that specialize in cannabis. And, um, and, and then other consultants. So it's a, it's a pretty, pretty large group of people that we're dealing with. Another concern, losing outside vendors. A couple of them um, you know, decided that they didn't want to do business with us anymore and so they've, they've, they've left um, or you know, we've parted ways. And, um, so, but we've been able to find new vendors um, and, and work our way through it. It's worked in part because they are offering services to an industry in desperate need of them an industry growing in numbers and cash. On balance, um, it's been a lot better for us and, and we're serving a lot more members. Like those in the cannabis business, Rosendahl is hopeful that Congress will pass the Safe Banking Act this year. It's gonna take some political courage. I think everybody knows that we have to find a solution to this cash problem, um, but it's, it's gonna take courage to take that first step. I mean, the House has done it, um, the, the Senate needs to do it too. Salal Credit Union also offers accounts to cannabis employees. Because of federal law, many of those employees have struggled to get access to a range of financial services, everything from car loans to credit cards and mortgages. One person who is supporting banks like Salal, who take on cannabis customers, is Washington State's Treasurer Dwayne Davidson, a Republican. Davidson actually opposed the initiative to legalize marijuana back in 2012, but after being elected state treasurer, he says he realized the issue of safe banking within the industry is one of public safety and transparency. I think primarily the biggest impact is that they cannot safely uh, make their uh, deposits of their revenue, and that's my primary concern. Uh, I don't think that the lack of banking services really hindered a lot of the expansion of the industry, but from a standpoint of uh, safety and also transparency of the issue, uh, uh, transparency of the uh, 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 industry and its revenues, it's a huge issue. We don't really know if our tax revenues are correct because, because of the situation. So, you know, it's legal in the state now and uh, legal industries should be able to bank their dollars. Treasurer Davison has traveled to Washington, D.C. and lobbied the National Association of State Treasurers to support cannabis banking reform. The group passed a resolution that he hopes will move along the legislation in the U.S. Senate. While Congress is still debating the Safe Banking Act, Tammy, I know you've looked into the debate over rescheduling marijuana, which would remove it from the group of drugs that are considered highly addictive in the Controlled Substances Act. What can you tell us about that? That's right, Jennifer. As the number of states allowing medical and recreational marijuana grows, so does the disconnect between federal and state policies. But there's a comprehensive bill making its way through Congress that could change that. Marijuana became illegal under the 1970 Controlled Substances Act. It was listed as a Schedule I drug, along with heroin and LSD, and it's been there ever since. But 50 years later, not everyone believes it still belongs there. I personally don't think the science supports having marijuana as a Schedule I drug. Congressman Denny Heck isn't the only lawmaker who feels that way. In November, the House Judiciary Committee voted 24 to 10 to approve the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, touted by proponents as one of the most comprehensive marijuana reform bills ever introduced in Congress. The Moore Act would remove criminal penalties for marijuana, expunge conviction records, and invest money into communities that have been disproportionately affected by prohibition. It would also remove marijuana from the federal controlled substance list. That's what cannabis reform groups hope to see. We believe it should be descheduled. There's no, there's no al alcohol is not on the schedule, and it is arguably less uh, harmful than alcohol. But other organizations like Smart Approaches to Marijuana say too much is still unknown about cannabis. We definitely think that marijuana should be made uh, easier to research, and if that involves creating uh, a special schedule like a Schedule 1R, um, where there are lower barriers to research so that we can uh, understand whatever medicinal benefits may be in, in, you know, in certain components of, uh, of the plant, there are, uh, there are a number of cannabinoids that show promise in treating certain medical conditions. Uh, obviously, CBD has gotten a, a, a great deal of attention as of late, but, but there are others that are, that are in the pipeline for, um, for research and, and, and drug development. Uh, so we very much support making it easier to, to do that, to reducing the barriers to research. 
The Drug Enforcement Administration defines Schedule One drugs as those with no currently accepted medical use and a high potential for abuse. But federal cannabis research can be a challenge. So researchers are in a catch-22. They can't conduct cannabis research until they show that cannabis has a medical use, but they can't demonstrate cannabis has a medical use until they can conduct research. The issue was brought up at a recent federal marijuana policy hearing held by the House Energy and Commerce Subcommittee on Health. So one of the key hurdles to research is that researchers require DEA approval. And for decades, they have only been allowed to obtain marijuana from one source, the University of Mississippi, which is the only contract that the National Institute for Drug Abuse has for research-grade cannabis. In the past, it may have made some sense to have this single source for research purposes. Certainly, if there are variations in quality or gradation, that can be minimized by having that single source. But because of the diversity now of the quality, potency, and other aspects of the marijuana that is available for individuals to obtain for medical and recreational purposes, and it does vary across the United States, research using this single source marijuana may not adequately assess what the current landscape represents. Not to mention, it is difficult to obtain the quantity necessary to conduct research in the existing structure. In 2016, the Department of Justice and the DEA announced a new policy to increase the number of approved sources of research-grade marijuana. The DEA says the program is moving forward. To ensure that this program is consistent with applicable laws and treaties, the department, in consultation with other federal agencies, continues to be engaged in a policy review process. In August 2019, DEA published a list of the 33 entities who have applied for registration and whose applications remain pending to grow marijuana pursuant to that policy. A forthcoming proposed rule, which has been drafted and submitted to the Office of Management and Budget, remains under development at this time. Despite the lack of research, proponents of legal marijuana hope to see the Moore Act become law. We'd love to see the end of federal prohibition. We'd like to see marijuana descheduled. We don't believe it belongs on Schedule One with heroin and ecstasy and other, you know, uh, life-threatening uh, drugs. In January, the House Small Business Committee waived its jurisdiction on the Moore Act, making it the second House committee to advance the legislation. It still has to get through several others, including energy and commerce and agriculture, before it can move to the Senate. Thanks, Tammy. Coming up, the industry in Washington state has changed since cannabis became legal nearly eight years ago. So how are state lawmakers dealing with the banking issue? That and more just ahead. Welcome back to Washington to Washington. It's no secret that cannabis is becoming a big business in this state. In 2018, Washington took in more than $367 million in fees and taxes from the industry, a $50 million increase from 2017. So how much influence does the industry have with lawmakers? We have to act. The feds have to act. Mm -hmm. Republican State Senator Ann Rivers didn't support Initiative 502 to legalize recreational marijuana back in 2012. But when it passed, she was selected by her caucus to work on the laws needed to get the industry up and running. And one thing she says cannabis businesses desperately need is safe banking. We hear the horror stories all the time about what it's like to try and manage a cash business. Rivers says banks need to be available to the industry, not just to support them, but also to track tax money. You can't track it. Um, that's another beautiful thing about banking is you can follow the money at every step. In this regard, we don't know. We, ha we truly have no idea. There's still a challenge with treating cannabis as a regulated industry like any other that ha would have normal access to financial institutions. Former State Representative Christine Reeves recently resigned from the state legislature and is potentially eyeing retiring Congressman Denny Heck's seat. She says states are leading on this issue and the federal government needs to take note. Washington and Colorado came online five years ago. Since then, we've had you know a dozen or so more states come online. So this is one of those trends where I think the states are actually pushing the federal government to respond to a need versus the federal government pushing policy implementation down on states. Um, and I actually think that's great, right? Because it's it's kind of from the people up uh, and changing the culture of America around how we address cannabis. As for the upcoming session.
Reeves touted a bill from Democrats that would allow out-of-state investors to invest in cannabis businesses. Currently in the state of Washington, um, cannabis businesses are not allowed to take investments into their company um, from out-of-state investors. Uh, and as an economic developer, this is what I've done for over 10 years, we don't really treat any other industry that way, right? When you think about how amazing our economy here is in Washington, it's because we have out-of-state investors who can invest in new technologies and innovation, um, and yet this is a, an industry that we're basically saying, no, 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 nobody else can participate. And the challenge with that, as I was describing it to somebody the other day, it's like, you know, you're, you're literally in a fishbowl, right, recycling the water. And we've got to get out of that mentality and make sure that these businesses have access to capital so that they can thrive. Senator Rivers is proposing legislation that would ban billboards promoting cannabis shops. She also wants to update the permitting process regarding where shops are located within communities. We inadvertently fuel um, the, the war between the retailers. Some, someone's putting in uh, his building right here, and then the person across the street gets a little leasehold and throws arcade and throws in some pinball machines, and now you've got a place where kids could go. And it's a dirty little trick. They never mean for kids to go in there. But we have to stop being the tool by which these people in the industry try to get a competitive advantage. And so that's something I'm going to be looking at. Washington lawmakers say they've done all they can to send a message to the federal government regarding banks who decide to take on cannabis customers. We promised them that as a state, we would stand behind mm -hmm. them if the feds came knocking. Right. So if something happens where the feds decide they want to act on these financial institutions, they will be protected by our attorney general. And that is something that no other state has done. But they acknowledge they need the other Washington to go further and pass the Safe Banking Act to solve the cannabis banking dilemma. We definitely need some help um, on the conservative side of the aisle to get away from that war on drugs culture and mentality and really help them understand that uh, it's, you know, we're, we're well into this industry and we need to be thinking about how we uh, build a national framework around it. My message is this, don't be afraid to have the adult conversation. Putting your head in the sand and pretending this is not happening is not a successful strategy. So just get off the dime and do it. Despite being medically legal in nearly three dozen states, the current federal classification of cannabis is keeping one group from using it. When it comes to legislation allowing veterans to use cannabis for issues like PTSD and pain management, it doesn't need to be explored. It needs to be adopted. Congressman Denny Heck represents Washington's 10th district, which includes the state's largest military base. There are an awful lot of service members that have come through Joint Base Lewis McCord that have been deployed and come back with post-traumatic stress. The fact of the matter is, it is widely recognized that this is one tool. It's not the be-all, end-all, it's not the silver bullet, but it is one tool that in some instances can help somebody that is suffering from that and other conditions. Nine million veterans are enrolled in the Department of Veterans Affairs healthcare program, the largest healthcare system in the country. But because marijuana is listed as a Schedule I drug, VA doctors can't recommend or prescribe it to patients, even in states like Washington where it's medically legal. Don Murphy with the Marijuana Policy Project says that's unacceptable. We absolutely believe that veterans should have access. In fact, veterans should probably have the first access. Several bipartisan bills focusing on veterans' access to marijuana have been introduced, including the VA Medicinal Cannabis Research Act of 2019. The legislation would require the VA to research the effects of medicinal cannabis on veterans diagnosed with PTSD and chronic pain. Garth Van Meter says research is something his organization supports. The Veterans Administration, I think, is the second largest funder of, of medical research in, in the country. Um, they do a great deal on, you know, on their own related to specific veterans' issues, and obviously PTSD is, is one of the primary, and, and, and pain management, um, you know, following uh, wartime injury is, is, is those are some of the greatest areas uh, you know that they do and so we, we very much support them being able to do that research. Federal requirements have made medical marijuana research for veterans issues a challenge. Despite that a 2017 VA policy change began allowing doctors to discuss marijuana with patients enrolled in state approved medical marijuana programs. But without research and training Van Meter said there are concerns. Part of it is that the, the 
the doctor doesn't know ultimately what, what he's recommending. So he may issue a blanket recommendation, uh, you know, and fill, fill out the state form, um, but then it's that, that patient who's going and essentially talking to a bud tender to decide what, you know, what product might be most suitable for, for their condition. And the bud, bud tender does not have medical training. Other proposed legislation includes the Veterans Equal Access Act. It would allow VA doctors to give recommendations and options for medical marijuana. And while protections are already in place, the Veterans Cannabis Use for Safe Healing Act would prevent veterans from being denied benefits for participating in medical marijuana programs. Several veterans organizations, including the American Legion, Veterans of Foreign War, and Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America support marijuana access for veterans. So does Murphy. It's somewhat inconsistent at best, maybe hypocritical at worst, that elected officials from, from Congress can go home and use their uh, subsidized health insurance, federally sell, uh, subsidized health insurance, to go to their doctor to get that recommendation, but a veteran can't. I call it the hero double standard. It's just absolutely uh, indefensible. If legislation passes allowing VA doctors to recommend or prescribe cannabis, it would still only be available to veterans living in states that have approved medical marijuana. Cannabis banking reform is clearly just one issue of many involving marijuana in states where it is legal and where it isn't. But some say the variety of issues that government needs to address is an indication that the industry is here to stay and that ideas around marijuana use have changed in a very short amount of time. Five years ago, you know, you had to go to Safeway and wait in the parking lot for your guy to come or go to a house you didn't know or, you know, you're going to buy something that may be poor quality and it's all a risk, you know, and you could get robbed there too. At least we've got a safer environment now. Thank you for joining us for Washington to Washington. We look forward to continuing our focus on the critical issues in this state. And talking with the people in both places who are working towards solutions. We welcome your feedback on this episode, as well as ideas for future episodes of Washington to Washington. Connect with us on social media at Wa to Wa and share your thoughts. For now, from Washington, D.C., thank you for watching. And from Washington State, we hope you'll join us next time on Washington to Washington.